Okay, welcome back everyone, Dr. Lindner. So what I'd like to talk about here is that uh, there is some protective covering of the brain and it's called the meninges. Many people have heard of meningitis. Uh, there could either be a bacterial infection or a viral infection uh, of the meninges. The meninges come in three flavors primarily. There is a piamata, an arachnoid, and the duramata. The duramata is the most superficial or it's the closest to the skull or to the bone, whereas the piamata is the closest to the actual neural tissue, to the brain or the spinal cord. And this is true whether we're talking about the brain or the spinal cord, we will have the same three layers. The dura mater, external, the arachnoid in the middle, and the pia mater, more deep internally. So um, deep to the arachnoid, we have an arachnoid, uh, where is it, subarachnoid space right here. And the subarachnoid space is very important because that's where cerebral spinal fluid is actually going to flow, or CSF, cerebral spinal fluid is going to flow. It's going to flow within this subarachnoid space. CSF is also going to flow through here. I'm going to outline this right here. I'm going to do this outlining it this way, you're going to hear of something called ventricles. And in the center, cerebral spinal fluid is going to flow, but it's also going to flow in this subarachnoid space. So you're going to have CSF in the center of the brain, but also circulating all around the outside of the brain as well. And those ependymal cells that we learned are found lining the choroid plexus. And the choroid plexus is found in the ventricles, in these chambers, the lateral ventricle. And there's two of them. So I'm going to put number one here, number two here. Those are the two lateral ventricles. Then there's a third ventricle right here. I'll put number three. And then there's a fourth ventricle down here. So there's four ventricles. And cerebral spinal fluid is going to flow from the two lateral ventricles into the third ventricle. And from the third ventricle, it gets into the fourth ventricle by draining into this cerebral aqueduct right here. From the fourth ventricle, there are some options here. It can go down the spinal cord, down the central canal, or there are some exit routes that it can take too through the lateral or median aperture to help circulate around the brain. And then when it gets way up at the top, where you have the superior sagittal sinus way up here at the top, it's like there's a sponge in here called the arachnoid villus where it gets reabsorbed by the arachnoid villi and it helps to filter it and cleanse it out and it goes through its circulation all over again. So we want to make sure that we have CSF and cerebral spinal fluid bathing around the brain. If we didn't have that fluid, anytime the head would move or you'd have impact, the brain would hit the bone. So thank goodness we have this cushioning around it of fluid and also inside. But there's also lots of ions and some glucose and ions that travel through that help with action potentials. Okay, so uh, in terms of blood flow to the brain, off of the heart, off of the heart, we have a brachiocephalic trunk. The term brachiocephalic, brachio means arm, Cephalic means head. So from that, one of those branches is going to go up. You see here right vertebral artery. So this vertebral artery 
is going to go right through the transverse processes of C1 to C6. And through the transverse processes, there's a hole through each of those transverse processes. The hole is called the transverse foramen, and the vertebral arteries go right through those transverse foramen of the transverse processes and find a way in to the magnum foramen, which is the hole at the bottom of the skull. And there is a circulation called the circle of Willis that brings blood, oxygen, and glucose into the brain. And after all the oxygen is dumped, it has to find a way into the venous system. And the venous system will then send it back eventually into the heart, into the superior vena cava, into the heart. The brain's gonna utilize about 20% of the body's oxygen and any interruption of the oxygen supply is, can result in permanent nerve damage or neuron damage and death of brain cells. If there's a glucose deficiency, there's mental confusion, dizziness, there can be convulsions or even unconscious. So that circle of Willis that I was referring to is this, if you look here, these are the two vertebral arteries, one on each side. They converge. They converge into a basilar artery, which is right here. And then the circle is right in here. So it's called a circle of Willis. And I'm not going to go into crazy, crazy detail because we're going to get into um, the heart and all the different blood vessels where. Uh, I will do a separate lecture just on the blood vessels of the brain. But the reason why you have this circle here is we need to try and make sure that if one vessel is occluded, there's a way of blood still getting into the brain through uh, a collateral circulation or another means. Okay. But the two main blood vessels that lead into the brain, you have the vertebral artery, and the other is going to be the internal carotid artery and it's cut but it comes right here let's see if i could draw an arrow right there is an internal carotid and then right there is the other internal carotid so even if a internal carotid gets blocked you still have the vertebrals bringing blood in if a vertebral artery gets blocked you still have the internal carotids if they both get blocked uh, we have a little bit of an issue the problem is when these uh if you have a clot that gets uh, a thrombosis that's moving in a larger dilated blood vessel it's not a problem it's if it gets stuck in these smaller ones if it gets lodged in a smaller blood vessel then we have a problem uh, then wherever that blood vessel is going to that's where you're going to have impaired function right with a stroke and that's when we ask uh, does the individual have any residuals remember if the stroke is on the left side of the brain they get hemiparesis on the right side of the body if the stroke is on the right side of the brain, they get hemiparesis on the left side of the body. That's because the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. The left side of the brain controls the right side of the body. Okay? When I say brain, I'm referring to the cerebrum. The cerebrum. These are the ventricles from the side view in blue. So these are the lateral ventricles. I said there were two of them. Lateral ventricles one and two and then here's the third ventricle and then here is the fourth ventricle and there are these little ducts in order for uh, csf to go from the first and second ventricle aka lateral ventricles to get into the third it has to go through the interventricular foramen and then to go from the third ventricle into the fourth ventricle it's got to go through the cerebral aqueduct. Then when it's in the fourth ventricle, it's got a few options. It can go down the central canal, down the spinal cord, or it can go through the median aperture or the lateral aperture, get out and start circulating around the brain. That's the flow of the CSF. The CSF is that liquid that's going to protect the brain and the spinal cord. And it has, um, it has ions in it that's important 
to help conduct nerve impulses, but also prevents against uh, physical injuries. It does carry some oxygen and some glucose and some other substances that help support neurological tissue. Now, we produce about three to five ounces. Within it is glucose, proteins, and ions. And we said it's good for mechanical protection, chemical protection, and for circulation. And we want it to try and filter and recycle it as fast as it's made, it should recycle it and return it back into circulation. But if there's some sort of blockage in any of these um, drainage facilities, like the interventricular foramen of Monroe or cerebral aqueduct or lateral or median apertures, what can happen is that you can get this blockage that can create this hydrocephalus. It just types of swells up and swells up and swells up. And then they have to create a shunt, getting that CSF down into the subclavian vein. Okay. So um, the choroid plexus, these are the ependymal cells that produce cerebral sp spinal fluid. They're found in all the ventricles. They're found in the lateral ventricles, the third ventricles, they're found in the fourth ventricle. It's found in all of them. Here's what it looks like in a cross section. Here's the chamber. This is where CSF is going to be stored. These are your lateral ventricles. Inside of the ventricles are the choroid plexus. This is the anterior horn of it. And back here is the posterior horn of the uh, lateral ventricles. And here is something called a falx cerebri, which is part of the meninge that kind of goes in here, it folds in and separates the two hemispheres of the, of the brain. We also have it back here. Again, this folding in, separating the two hemispheres. Just another view of the ependymal cells. These are ependymal cells that are producing the cerebral spinal fluid. Another view of the lateral ventricle system. The reason why we have two lateral ventricles is because there's one in each hemisphere of the brain. So those are the lateral ventricles. Here's the third. In order for CSF to go from the lateral ventricles into the third, it has to go through the duct work here called the interventricular foramen of Monroe, here and here. They go from the third into the fourth ventricle. Again, it's got to go through the cerebral aqueduct. After it's in the fourth ventricle, it can go down the spinal cord in that central canal, or it can exit through lateral and median apertures. Okay, so I've done that flow a few times. I don't have to repeat it. Um, one thing that I did mention earlier is it can get reabsorbed right here through the arachnoid villi on the top of the skull is the superior sagittal sinus right here. And there are these grape-like structures, the grape-like structures called arachnoid villi. And that's important to help reabsorb the cerebral spinal fluid. And it should be reabsorbed at the same rate that it's produced Otherwise, if there's a blockage of that drainage of CSF by either a tumor or inflammation, a developmental malformation, meningitis, uh, birth trauma, then it causes hydrocephalus. And hydrocephalus is when it looks like this. And the neurosurgeon can implant a drainage shunt draining the CSF to the veins of the neck. Okay, good place to take our break.